Hello and welcome back to the last lecture of Introduction to General Relativity. In today's lecture, we will detail the calculations of the deflection of light by heavenly bodies. For me, this is one of the most spectacular predictions of general relativity, that light itself is curved by the gravitational field. And even more spectacular is that this curvature can be detected uh, on, with terrestrial observations and was detected, in fact, back in 1919 already. So to commence the discussion of this uh, calculation, we should recall uh, a couple of facts about the, the motion or the structure of geodesics in the Schwarzschild solution. So we've got this energy equation. So remember that we modeled a geodesic in the Schwarzschild solution uh, we, we obtained a effective one-dimensional classical mechanics model that uh, corresponds to the geodesic coordinates in the Schwarzschild solution. And key here is the following energy equation. So by introducing uh, an effective energy equation, this is not the energy uh, of, of the null geodesic directly. Um, it's just... A, an effective interpretation of this quantity for uh, geodesics as a uh, using this one-dimensional analogy, one-dimensional classical mechanic analogy. Now, for null geodesics, there's this constant kappa. If you can go back and look into uh, lectures 21 and 22 to understand that, get this constant kappa is zero for null geodesics. So, uh, if you look at this energy equation, it looks like that of a single non-relativistic particle moving in this funny potential, this kind of quartic, uh, cubic quadratic potential. Um, and, uh, well, we we'll might as well isolate this effective potential just to, just to uh, emphasize this point. So there's an effective radial potential that this fictitious particle is moving in. And uh, it is based on the angular, um, effective angular momentum and the mass of the celestial body. So that's some potential, right? So you, we can plot this if we so choose. And what we will find is something that doesn't look unlike uh, the kinds of potentials that you have bind, binding uh, subatomic particles to nuclei. So you know, the potential looks something like this, goes up and decays off. And uh, the, we want to understand this potential because the radial motion is really determined by a classical particle moving in this potential. So obviously it's kind of important to understand this potential. And in particular, there's you know one important point here in this potential, namely this potential uh, stationary point here. And that's going to play an important role in any classical motion in, in this potential. So if you have some classical particle, radial particle, you can imagine several scenarios like this radial particle, uh, this particle zooms up the potential doesn't have enough energy to crest the potential and zooms away again, that would reflect an orbit of a null geodesic that uh, comes close to the heavenly body and then goes away. Or maybe the, heaven, uh, the, the incoming particle has enough energy to go over the potential barrier and then it decays or accelerates to negative in t uh, potential energy. So in other words, that rep represents a null geodesic which gets caught by this potential, captured. And so it's obviously very important that we uh, understand where this point is that I've highlighted in yellow. How can we work that out? Well, this is now first year calculus. We can just take the derivative of the effective potential and set it to zero. That'll give us the stationary points. There's only one stationary point, which you can sort of see graphically. Um, and doing that derivative, which is what I'm doing here, uh, leads us to the following equation minus 3r minus 2m plus r and uh, well you know this goes away right for solving for the for the maxima uh, for the extrema and uh, we learn that the maxima is at r equals 3m so what does that tell us well for large masses you know suppose m goes asymptotically towards infinity it can't in general relativity but suppose then uh, 
a null jute is again the presence of a large mass will clearly be strongly affected, right? Because this maximum is very high, and so you have um, uh, and and the, the the potential will spread out, and so this will uh, lead to very noticeable effects to the propagation of null geodesics. So I'll just indicate on this plot that this is the point three m, and you know for scale I'll sort of put on a couple of other points. There we go. Now, uh, we want to understand, in the rest of this video, how does a null geodesic propagate in the presence of such a, uh, in the presence of a heavenly body? So for that, um, I'll sort of set up the, the, the scenario here, we have a heavenly body like the sun, and we have a geodesic. So there's all sorts of scenarios, but the scenarios we're going to focus on here is we'll focus on scattering type scenarios. So that's our goal for the rest of the lecture. So a scattering type scenario, you know, you have uh, infinite, sort of infinitely far away, t equals minus infinity, you have an incoming null geodesic, and then that's not affected by the Schwarzschild uh, geometry, infinitely far away, the Schwarzschild geometry is asymptotically flat. And as this null geodesic comes towards the heavenly body, the geodesic is going to be affected by the curvature of the Schwarzschild solution, and will be deflected and then infinitely far away in the future, it'll propagate eventually in a straight line again. And to understand this type of scenario, it's very convenient not to use the position of the, the, the particle or photon in this case, but to actually use a slightly different parameter to measure the relative position of the incoming null geodesic and the heavenly body. And so for that, we're going to set up a, uh, a coordinate called the impact parameter. And But to do that first, we'll have to talk a little bit about asymptotic flatness and identify which uh, constants in these solutions correspond to what uh, impact parameters and how to define it. So the first step is to define, uh, to identify inside the constants L and E inside our governing equation for the geodesic uh, an important other constant, namely, we notice that L divided by E represents the distance of closest approach to the center. I'll sort of argue how to show that, uh, show how to argue that in a second. All right, so here's how you might argue this. Um, it's not so difficult. So, um, you know, you go to a coordinate system where the heavenly body is at, where we, we're using just simply um, polar coordinates. So the black line here is a, uh, a geodesic, uh, this is in the case where M is naught. So, that up here. So suppose M is naught, so we've got a flat, a flat geometry. So we have the heavenly body here at the center of the coordinate system. And you imagine a geodesic propagating along, a photon moving along this geodesic, and you specify the position of this photon with a radius and a uh, angle variable phi, and then you note that the position of closest approach is here with the intersection of the geodesic and the coordinate y-axis in yellow. Um, this y-intersect is at r naught, that's the position of closest approach, and uh, x is equal to t, that's the actual trajectory. So the, the, the trajectory itself follows, has these coordinates as a function of time, y is always r naught, and x is equal to t. And then you, uh, you can calculate L divided by E, or r squared times by d phi dt for the solution, and then you set 
uh, you find that the time point when the trajectory is intersecting the y-axis and you'll find that L divided by E and D gives R naught. So that's, uh, that, that, that gives us that interpretation for the case uh, M is naught. Now, uh, L divided by E does not necessarily uh, equal the position of closest uh, approach for a curved geometry. However, as mentioned several times, the Schwarzschild solution or geometry is asymptotically flat. And so by the way, I should have stressed this, um, uh, L divided by E equals R naught no matter what T is in this flat case here. So in particular, L divided by E equals R naught when the trajectory is infinitely far away from the scattering center or the heavenly body. Now the Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild geometry is asymptotically flat. So when you're infinitely far away from the heavenly body, then you uh, you can interpret everything as you would for a flat geometry. So in particular, uh, for a light ray photon uh, very far from the origin, so R is much bigger than the, the, the M parameter, the constant L divided by E represents an apparent impact parameter. So one thing I should say is that R naught here is what we call an impact parameter. R naught is an impact parameter. What does that mean? It means a displacement relative to, uh, so you imagine the scattering uh, trajectory and you measure the, the distance of the closest approach of the scattering trajectory to your target and that represents your impact parameter. Well, that's what, how we define the impact parameter. Now, uh, for the Schwarzschild geometry when M is not zero, uh, we can, by thinking asymptotically, th imagining that the, the light impingent light ray is infinitely far away from the heavenly body, we can hereby interpret, therefore, the constant L divided by E um, as an apparent impact parameter. So B, we'll call it B. L, B is L divided by E. And so B, this constant L divided by E, represents sort of the distance between the, uh, the, the axis which go, runs right through the center of the heavenly body and the impingent trajectory. And so now imagine you look at the heavenly body and you are a light ray. So there's the heavenly body and you are the light ray and you are impingent on this uh, celestial body. So you're infinitely far away. You're looking at it and you're, you're heading towards it. Of course, no time passes, right? You're on the light ray. So there's, but uh, whatever, um, invoke your imagination that you are a light ray and then you are, you could, depending on how far away you are from the scattering center of this heavenly body, you, uh, in, when you're infinitely far away, the scattering center is a distance B equals L divided by E, effectively away from your uh, initial trajectory. So you imagine your light ray trajectory heads parallel to the axis running through the heavenly body and B measures the distance displacement of the impingent axis uh, trajectory from this axis. 
as the light ray gets closer, of course, to the heavenly body, so this circle with a cross in it means the, the sort of the target point that the light ray is would effectively hit if there was no curved geometry. Uh, now, it's important to note that, right, because the geometry is curved, this effective distance will be closed once the trajectory gets close to the heavenly body because it, the geometry um, affects the geodesic. And it could be that the particle gets trapped or not um, by this heavenly body, right? It depends on, on this radial motion. So if we go back to here, to this is this radial potential. If you are, if the radial uh, energy is insufficient to crest this uh, maxima, then the, the impingent trajectory will come in and uh, be affected by the celestial body and fly away. However, for energies greater than, actually I don't like this wobbly circle, I'll draw a real circle. If you have an energy uh, greater than VF maxima. So if the incoming light ray has uh, energy uh, well, half E squared greater than v, F, v max, which is 3M, then it is uh, captured, right? So that's de defined uh, by this red circle here. So any, as we'll see, any light incoming light ray that has an energy bigger than uh, enough to, to crest the, the radial potential maxima uh, will be, uh, these energies will be defined by a circle. The circle won't have necessarily have the same radius as the celestial body. And then you will find that if your impact parameter lies within this red circle, then you will be captured. And so this is, uh, this red circle has a name um, and the area of that circle is very important. And that's called the impact, uh, the, the cross section. So because some trajectories they can reach R equals zero and hence be captured. Um, we estimate this capture area or capture radius or capture cross section. of the object. So this is i.e. area of the target that captures geodesic. And that area, we traditionally use the symbol signal in scattering, a sigma in scattering theory for this area, and it's pi times the capture radius squared. So the capture radius is BC squared. And to, to calculate BC, the capture radius, and therefore the red circle, so this is the red circle. So the red circle is the effective sort of target area where an incoming knowledge geodesic will be captured by the heavenly body. And how do we, we want to calculate now BC? And to do that, we've got to relate BC to the energy and that energy better be bigger than the maximum of the radial um, effective potential. Okay, so we need to know the height of the maximum potential. So a half E squared has got to equal the potential at the maximum. That's when the radius is three times M. And that equals a little calculation later. L squared M divided by two times three M cubed. And uh, well, we need to work out what is the the B parameter, not the E, you know, it's all very well to have E, but what, well, uh, we want B. Well, 
B is uh, defined to be L divided by E, right? So we just need to rearrange this equation to find L divided by E's. And that's super easy here because you can already see there's an E squared on one side and an L squared on the other. And we end up with this equation, L squared divided by E squared equals 27M squared. Uh, and that tells us that BC is root three, um, or three to the three halves times m. So now we know the apparent, Im and thus, well, now we know the apparent impact radius, capture radius, if you like, of this heavenly body. And now we can work out the impact cross section, sigma, to be 27 pi m squared. So the bigger the m, the larger the cross section. And so for something like a black hole solution, which we won't be able to cover in an introductory course on general relativity, but which is indeed covered, uh, which is indeed uh, modeled by Schwarzschild solution, you can see that the larger M, the, the larger this uh, capture cross section that, that such a uh, celestial body will have. Now, trajectories whose impact parameter or impact effective impact uh, distance uh, which exceed this BC capture radius, well, they, they, they won't be captured, right? So if you're heading towards a black hole and B is bigger than BC, then you won't be sucked in. Now, our goal is to understand how much you're deflected by as you zoom past this uh, massive celestial object and you are a null geodesic. So for that, we wanna uh, understand the, the value of the angular parameter phi as a function of the radius parameter. Well, from lecture 22, we actually obtained this formula. And we can uh, study this, this, uh, this quantity and try and understand how much total deflection a uh, incoming trajectory will experience. So if we go back to the, the picture here I have of the scattering setup. So here, here comes the, in, the, the particle comes in and then it has some, we wanna understand what's the, the total angle phi deflection. That's our goal now, it's just to work out delta phi, which measures the total angle of deflection of the null geodesic as it zooms past the heavenly body. The goal is to calculate your total angular shift, total angular deflection. How's that defined? Well, just work out your d radial variable for tau is plus infinity. This is your affine parameter. And subtract from it the angle when tau is minus infinity. And that's your total deflection. Now for such trajectories, um, the turning point is at a radial coordinate r equals r naught. And r naught, well, we can work that out in a second. And we, the way we can work out r naught is we can go back to this radial potential here. So remember, here's the radial potential experienced by the effective particle and you have an incoming trajectory, and then it comes up, it doesn't have enough energy to crest the potential, and that turning point here, that's R naught. We wanna work out R naught. How do we work out R naught? Well, R naught is when the energy equals the effective potential energy. And 
we have ourselves. By rearranging, we bring the energy over through to the right hand side so that we can replace L squared divided by E squared with the impact parameter squared. And then, well, we do a little bit more rearranging to get an equation, which we'll call equation one. We actually get a cubic equation for this turning point. So we've got to find the zero of a cubic polynomial equation. You can do that. Uh, it is analytically solvable up to quartic equations. You can find these zeros. And uh, well, I'll just quote the answer to you because it's a pain. So that the, the largest radius for which the potential equals the total energy is the largest zero of that cubic polynomial. And I'll just quote that. I mean, you could work it out numerically if you want, or you can just believe me that it is 2b root 3 cos 1 third arc cos minus 3 to the 3 halves. M on B. So that's okay. You can believe me. And now, um, now that we have the the turning point, that's the distance, the closest distance of the trajectory to the heavenly body, we can go ahead and solve this differential equation here. So this this differential equation uh, is the one that will allow us to compute the total angular shift. That's the one we want to integrate now. Actually, the total angular shift is we're just going to integrate both sides and then set input the limits. We know that when tau is minus infinity, r is minus infinity, uh, r is infinity, and so on. This, this equation here takes a little justifying, right? So we're going to integrate this equation uh, from the point of closest, the radius of closest approach to infinity. Now, I put a two in front of there. Why is that? Well, you've got two parts to this angular shift differential equation. So if you look at the first epoch, right, the, the, the null does is getting closer, 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 until it reaches the point r equals r naught of closest approach. And then it gets further and out. And now if you imagine the angular shift generated part through this trajectory, well, the angular shift uh, adds up, right? As you come in, it gets more and more and more. And then you've got a symmetric um, epoch where the particle is now exiting the potential well, the gravitational well. And there the angular uh, deflection just adds up. So we get twice the angular deflection. We get a contribution when the radius comes in to R naught and we have a contribution from when the radius goes from R naught back to R equals infinity again. That's why there's a two here at the front of this integral. So this integral is just literally integrating this yellow boxed uh, expression on the right hand side. So it's symmetric about R equals R naught. And now, okay, so this is a bit of a pain, this integral. Um, you just have to be believe me or work it out that, you know, making the following su substitution is a good thing to do. Makes your life a tad easier. But this integral is not trivial. One thing we can do, however, is set uh, m is zero, and just as a sanity check, you know what happens when m is zero. Well, 
Well, when m is zero, we have flat space time, and we calculate as an exercise that uh, the total angular shift is pi. Okay, as it should be, right? And you come in, if you look at now the trajectory of a null geodesic in the flat case, well, phi goes from minus um, pi to pi. And since we've defined the angular shift in the way that we have here, you can see that the total angular shift is pi. Now let's investigate delta phi as a function of m. Right? We really want to understand what's the angular shift in the case where uh, we are interested in uh, realistic celestial bodies like the sun or something like that. Well, it's non-trivial. And uh, that's because this limit uh, becomes singular. At m equals zero. Which is a pain, right? Because if you want to expand around the smallness of m and something becomes singular at the thing that you're expanding around, then the Taylor series approximation doesn't work exactly there. So we're going to avoid this uh, in the following way. Uh, we, we promote instead, so this is interrelationship between M and R naught, but instead what we're going to do is we promote M and R naught to independent variables, and then we will do our expansion, and then we'll set, we'll fix uh, M to be equal to R naught, M to depend on R naught in the correct fashion. So we'll compare delta phi, which is now a function of m and r naught, and we'll compare this angular deflection uh, for light rays with the same r naught. First step is to eliminate B via equation one, right? So equation one up here is the equation for the turning point. And that tells us that B is a function of R naught and M. So that gives us a, the total angular deflection to be two, zero, goes from, integral goes from zero to one over R naught. So substituting in that value of B, Gives us this nasty looking thing. And now the goal is to expand. We've gotten rid of uh, B out of the story now. So we're gonna expand delta phi as a function of uh, the smallness, as a Taylor series in the smallness of M. So I've just drawn the first two terms of a Taylor series. Well, we already know what the zeroth order term is, it's pi. So we need to work out the, the first order correction. And for that, we need to do it. this derivative of this angular deflection as a function of m and set it to m is zero. Remembering that we've decoupled m and r naught, right? By making r naught independent.
and it's a you know, somewhat tedious derivative. We'll just pass the derivative with respect to m through the integral sign. And this simplifies a little, little bit. By substituting or using the relationship between R0 and the impact parameter, we arrive at the following much simpler expression, four divided by B. And so here we've used something, right? We've used the fact that um, R naught equals B naught. So th there's, you know, a kind of warning warning here, right? What's happened here? I've changed R naught for B naught. Um, well, we've used the following Taylor series. So if you remember, We've got this equation here that uh, sets R naught as a function of B. If you look at this for long enough, you should see that R naught is effectively determined by B in this equation. And we want to understand that to lowest order in M. There's M features there as well. So we've used the fact that when you take cos of the third of R cos of X, then that equals root three over two, the first couple of terms in the Taylor series, plus x over six minus x squared over 12 root three, blah, 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 blah. So using um, the fact that r naught is two b over root three, so r naught is two b over root three cos one third r cos of this argument there, we can obtain a relationship correct to first order in M of the interrelationship between R naught and B. And this equals B minus 3M. So to zeroth order R naught is B, right? And so to order M, we've just learned that delta phi is approximately pi plus 4M over B. And this is the correction. So before we continue with the correction, I should just pause to uh, distinguish two angular deflections that uh, have appeared in this lecture. So delta phi is the total change in angular variable throughout the trajectory's uh, lifetime. Right, so delta phi is a very simple thing to interpret. It's just the total angular change of the trajectory. And so that's why when uh, for flat space time, the total angular change is simply pi, right? You go from phi uh, is effectively zero through to pi or phi is minus pi over two to pi over two, depending on where you set the zero to phi. Now there's an additional angular change, which in the figure up here, I had written as uh, big delta phi, but actually I should have written it as little delta phi. There's an additional angular shift due to the curvature of the geodesic. And that uh, is this correction factor, and that is delta phi, little delta phi, just so that we don't confuse our notations. So for um, a trajectory moving in a small uh, celestial body such as the sun, there is or can be a perceptible correction to the total angular variable change throughout a trajectory's lifetime. 
So, uh, for example, for a light ray um, grazing or touching the edge of the sun, uh, this this correction is about um, 1.75 seconds of arc. So it's just about perceptible. Uh, it was uh, confirmed in 1919, although the error bars have always been pretty high on this, this sort of experiment. And this was by the Dyson Eddington Davidson collaboration. Uh, the, it, this is difficult to, to uh, get the error bars down because the sun is such a bright emitter in the sky. Um, in fact, it's far better to look at the bending of radio waves by, uh, from quasars. There you can uh, get the error bars a lot further down. And so these predictions have been confirmed by experiments. better confirmation. So that's it for this lecture and indeed for this course. Thank you for joining me on this journey through uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. I hope you'll agree with me that it's an extraordinary theory that is that has a level of beauty that is unparalleled by many other theories in physics. We've only really scratched the surface of the general theory of relativity. There's been active research in this area since the early 20s, and that's nearly a century of active research on uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. And there's now an immense amount of things known and an immense number of interesting and fascinating topics. And these uh, problems are of ever greater significance as we understand and, uh, and perform better cosmological observations of our universe. And in fact, in a way, the largest mysteries that remain open in physics are those that arise in general relativity and cosmology. But that's it for today and for this course. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you hopefully next time. Goodbye.